Hello, sixth graders. We'll be starting on chapter one in, in this book, Following Christ. Uh, we'll get through, we'll do about half the chapters in this book, uh, and then later part of the year we'll be going through the scriptures, uh, kind of a, a quick run through of the story of salvation. Uh, and so you're, uh, kind of just to get a broad overview of uh, the, the biblical story. All right, so we're going to start working through this book. So chapter one, let's, let's jump in. Oh, introduction. We'll need that. So chapter one, we'll be starting on the Ten Commandments, uh, going through them. Oops, let's see here. Oh, there are my faces. Ah, ah. All right, chapter one, God gives us the law. So we're talking about the Ten Commandments, kind of this first part, and then uh, kind of later this year we'll, uh, in the book, uh, we'll get to the, the Mass briefly, and then we'll, we'll go to the, into the Bible. Um, so God gives us the law. And if you obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. If we observe the world around us, we will see that there is a certain order in the way things happen. Throw a stone in the air, and it falls back to the ground. We say it does, not, does that because of the law of gravity. Wild geese will fly for miles and miles to return and to return every year to the same place to nest and hatch their goslings. They do this that by instinct. And if we look at men now and through the ages in different countries and cultures, we will find that they always have a rule about right and wrong. Do good and avoid evil. Human beings all over the earth have the, have the idea that they ought to behave in a certain way. Now, the difference between this rule of human behavior and the law of gravity or instinct is that the law of gravity or instinct tells us what things do, and the rule of human behavior tells us what we ought to do. In other words, the stone or goose has no choice in the matter. The stone doesn't decide if it's going to fall back to earth. I'm like, well, I'm not going to go back. I'm going to maybe fly, out, fly around a little bit. Uh, uh, it must return to the earth. But while the rule of human behavior may tell us what is right and wrong to do, we are still free to decide just what we will do. This presents two problems. The first problem is that though all men might agree that we should do good and avoid evil, they don't always agree about what is good and what is evil. So the what, what exactly is good and evil. Uh, in fact, people are often mistaken about the beh what behavior is right and wrong. So how can we know for sure? First problem is, how do we know what is right and what is wrong? All right, especially in more complicated matters. The second problem concerns our reasons for following this, human, this law of human behavior. Since men aren't forced to act in accord with the law, but may choose freely what they do. So they can, we can decide, well, I know what is right and wrong, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do what I want to do instead. All right, so it's, uh, the master plan. Where can we find the solution to these problems? The best way is to look to the master plan and see what he has, master planner, and see what he has in mind. As we all know, God is the creator and Lord of heaven and earth. In his great wisdom, he made the universe and governs it all. Now, just as he made the law of gravity and instinct, he made all men with the idea of doing good and avoiding evil. But he also made men with free will, allowing them to choose to do good or avoid and avoid evil. So part of our nature as humans, all right, there's everything has a nature, a certain way it acts. Humans have the special kind of power of free will, this ability to, to act this way or that. Uh, we don't just follow mere instinct like animals. When Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, their sin affected all men that were to come. One result of original sin, that it is harder for us to know what is right and wrong and behave accordingly. So it darkens our intellect, our minds to know what is what is right and wrong, and then also it's harder to choose choose what is right. If we read the beginning of the Old Testament, we can easily see that men will soon make a mess of things. We'll see that later this year when we go through the uh, right after that part of the, the Bible. But God promised Abraham that he would not abandon us and would give us a means of salvation. 
So God called upon Abraham and made him the father of his chosen people. God established his covenant with the Israelites to show that he would be their God and they would be his people. He gave them the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. God warned his people to know what was right and wrong and what, what was uh, wanted his people to know what was right and wrong and what was truly good and truly bad for them. He was preparing them for a special role in salvation history. Salvation. So we've got the Decalogue, which is, this means, ten, it's Greek for, it's from the Greek, 10 word means 10 words. Like, uh, Deca is for 10 log words. Uh, um, 10 commandments. So Decalogue, another name for the 10 commandments. And then salvation history, God's plan to save humanity. All right. So when we read the, there's the Bible, parts of the Bible and stuff, this next, we'll go through kind of that the big overview of salvation history. But some people think that God simply wanted obedience to set to a set of rules. What he really wanted is a faithful people. He gave his people a law to teach and guide them in every part of their lives. Further, he, wa he gave his people a law to prepare them for the coming of the Savior. Very important. God just doesn't give a law. Well, I'm going to make a bunch of rules and see if people follow them or not. No, no, actually the law is, he's pointing out, how we're going to flourish, all right? Here are the guardrails, if you will. Uh, if you were over a bridge or over driving over near a cliff, you have those guardrails, all right, near the near the roads, in case you don't veer off. That's kind of what God's commandments are. They keep us on the road so we can grow and flourish and not go off into the ditch or off a cliff spiritually. Fulfillment of the law. When Jesus came to establish the new covenant, he did not set aside the Ten Commandments but completed them. He said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus teaches that the foundation of all law is love, to love God above all things with one's whole mind and heart and soul, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. Jesus wants all men to, re to turn their minds and hearts to God with love, Obeying any of the t disobeying any of the Ten Commandments is a failure to love either God or our neighbor. This is because the Ten Commandments sum up our duties to God and our neighbor. They're all they all have to do with relationships. All right, our relationship with God and relationship with others. The importance of relationships. Um, and then this aspect of love. So Jesus found is the love is the foundation. And actually, in the Old Testament, that's very much that's very much the foundation. Uh, of of the Old Testament law as well, we'll see. We'll see. Jesus makes it much more much clearer, uh, and how people kind of more got uh, some of the Jews uh, during Jesus's time when he walked the earth, uh, kind of got st stuck more on the rules and forgot about kind of the foundation, right? So when we go through the Bible I'll pull, later this year, I'll show you some of those passages where it's very clear. God God loves. He wants us to grow in love, even in the Old Testament. It's not like something. When Jesus comes, oh, now now God wants us to love. No, nope, it's always always was that way. Jesus makes it makes it clear. So conscience, all right. How do we know that one action is right from another? Along with free will, God has given each man the ability to judge if something is right or wrong. This ability is called conscience. All right, very important. This ability, all right. It's not a uh, our conscience is a very practical tool. It tells us what would be right or wrong behavior in a given situation. We are to obey our conscience, for God gave it to us so that we would live according to his law. All right, so every person is born with a conscience. Even a member of some primitive tribe that has never come into contact with civilization has the same law in his heart to do good and avoid evil. His tribe will probably have a code of what they think is right and wrong. He will be responsible before God for doing what he thinks is right and not doing what he thinks is wrong. In this way, he can please God. But his code of behavior may differ somewhat from the Ten Commandments. Since he has no contact with the Ten Commandments, he will not be held responsible for obeying them. Nevertheless, his conscience is faulty. So what does that mean? Well, someone who has never heard the gospel, uh, if they follow their conscience, truly are following it, and they're, God's grace, they're allowing God's grace to work in their life, even if they don't know it. Uh, God can still bring them salvation in a hidden way. 
but there's it's 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 a, it's a um, uh, their salvation isn't particularly in jeopardy because they have this faulty conscience because they might start kind of believing well you know this I I feel I, I really know this is wrong but my tribe says my group of people I'm like, they say it's right so I'm gonna do it right even though I, I really know this is wrong and they can start to drift away all right uh, so that's the importance of what God reveals uh, the Ten Commandments to us so that we're clear it's clear like here's here's the guardrails a conscience has to be taught and taught correctly we call this forming a conscience the conscience of the primitive man since it was not formed con correctly is called an incorrect conscience since he can do nothing about that he will not be held responsible for his incorrect conscience on the other hand all men who have access to the Word of God have a responsibility to form a correct conscience now just a, a little note there even the man even the kind of let's say the primitive man who it doesn't have like sophisticated you know, live in civilization and stuff, but he hell has a responsibility to do what, what he knows is truly right and truly wrong, all right? So he can't just go along with whatever his friends or his group of people are doing, all right? So even though his conscience in, in different areas can be correct, foundationally, he has to still uh, do what he knows is truly right and truly wrong. Uh, and there are certain things that uh, we'll never, we can't erase from, for example, murder, all right? Murder, you can never justify that all right that's something kind of uh, do good and avoid evil no don't take innocent life all right so there's certain things that you can't say well I just didn't know it was right or wrong no it's kind of uh, in, burned into our into our, the hard wire of our heart uh, God has given us the means to form our consciences correctly he has revealed truths about himself and given us the Ten Commandments to live according to the will of God we must follow and obey the commandments. If we disregard or break God's law, we sin. If we deliberately break a commandment in a serious matter, we commit a moral sin and destroy charity or the love of God in our souls. We break friendship with God. When we commit a moral sin, we reject God by choosing to do something seriously contrary to God's will. Essentially, you're saying, the person is saying, my will is higher than God's will. I don't want to be under God's will. If we do not repent of mortal sin, we cannot go to heaven and be happy with God forever. Of course, whether or not what we do is a mortal sin depends on whether we know what we ought to, what we are doing is seriously wrong, and we freely choose to do it anyway. And if we do commit a mortal sin, God will forgive us if we truly repent of our sin. He's given us the sacrament of penance to forgive our sins and to help us to grow closer to him. All right, so even if we break friendship with God, God's given us a means to restore that friendship through the sacrament of penance or confession or also called reconciliation, sacrament of reconciliation. But besides giving us the law, he has given us reasons why we, sh we want to follow it. First, God is the giver and author of, of the, that law. And since he is our creator, he knows what is best for us. And in, he, he, he higher, hardwired us. He knows how we operate best, how we flourish, grow. Obeying God's law is necessary for our eternal salvation. How could we live with God forever if we chose to reject his life and his friendship by serious sin? If we want to I say, I want to go to heaven, but you know what? I want to cut friendship off. I really don't want to live in friendship with God here. Well, why would I want to live in, why would a person want to live in friendship with God forever in heaven then? If, if they're kind of, they're setting their heart against him. But an even greater reason to obey God is, that we want we know his great love for us Jesus tells us if we if you love me you will keep my commandments what better way do we have of showing our love for God than by doing what he asks of us so foundationally we show our love toward God by obeying his commandments God gave us his commandments and our conscience to help us know right from wrong he gave us the example of his son Jesus Christ who perfectly loved and obeyed the Father. At the same time, God gave us the power to keep his commandments. That power is the life of grace that comes from the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Now, here's some questions. You may find these helpful. I'm not going to go, most times I'll go through these, but I got a little uh, little Prezi presentation on conscience to help uh, maybe illuminate a little more of what conscience means. All right, these are some, some silly things in here too. 
All right, let's uh, let's make me small. Uh, all right, I'm way up here. All right, conscience. Here we are, conscience. Okay. Now, I originally had two embedded videos when I made this Prezi uh, a number of years ago, and no longer there. Um, so they were. I'll show you the picture of what they were. Uh, they originally. Uh, where is it? Here it is. All right. Here is what they originally. Oh, you can't even. So one of them was Jiminy Cricket and a little Pinocchio. Let your small voice people won't listen to. Conscience, let your conscience be your guide. All right, so conscience for uh, Jiminy Cricket and Pinocchio is kind of this external voice. All right, it's telling you what to do. Uh, and then we have, this is from Enker's New Groove. Kronk is his name. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's Dilemma. And so there's this one scene where, uh, an angel appears on one shoulder and the devil on the other, and they start arguing. Kind of, you should do this, or you shouldn't do that, or um, do this. Um, so, so those are the two. Vi oops, oops. Those are the two, two videos that are missing here. Oops. So, which is right? Well, they both contain a grain of truth, but both distort the true meaning of conscience. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean by that is. Uh, let's see here, Jiminy Cricket here. Uh, it's not. It's kind of presents it as an external voice. Well, it's no, no. Our, our conscience is within us. Uh, and then here's kind of the two angels. It's another aspect of the internal voice. It's like external. Well, it's the angel, the devil, and just kind of. But the reality of our conscience is is something within us, uh, and sometimes it's called a small voice within that inner small voice within us, which. Is partly right, uh, but it can, can be misleading, actually. So conscience. Here we are. So it's, it's two compound words with knowledge. Conscience. Oh, yeah. Science, actually, the word from Latin means knowledge. So it means knowledge. So what is it? It's And what it's not. So here, here's what it is. It's not an external voice. It's not a power of the soul like the intellect. Power. So it's not like I have a, a re reason, the intellect, and the willpower. And then I have another thing, the conscience. Another power in there. No, it's not. Deter it doesn't determine right is right or wrong. It's like, well, I get to choose what's right or wrong. No, no, it doesn't determine right or wrong. Uh, it doesn't allow me to say, well, my conscience says so, to do whatever I want to do. Instead, it's, uh, this is kind of technical, the application of moral truth to determine how one is to act in a certain situation. I'll come back to that with some other examples. It's really applying what, what I know is right and wrong to a particular situation. You do it all the time. Like your parents have told, given you maybe rules like uh, don't, uh, let's see here, don't chew with your mouth open, uh, you know, at meals. Uh, so when you're at meals, you don't chew with your mouth open, all right? So it's applying kind of, it's an act of your intellect, your mind, which applies moral truth to a particular uh, moral, uh, the moral action, uh, which applies moral truth. Uh, the moral action of the moral truth. Okay, that's that's misspelling. All right, so it's it's application of truth. All right, and we we act the act we call conscience is really this judge this internal judgment where it's like this is what I know I ought to do. All right, our mind it's not uh, and it's conforming with I know what is right. All right, so so it needs to be formed. So we got calibrated. All right, okay. If you have a car gets a tune up. Well, our conscience needs to kind of be tuned up with scripture, sacred tradition, and the church. So the written word of God and the unwritten oral tradition that the Holy Spirit guards this and guards it in, through the life of the church. Uh, and then grace, the sacraments, especially confession. It helps get rid of the muck, uh, kind of the earwax, if you will, in our heart. Uh, we can hear the Lord. We can be open to God's graces. Conscience doesn't pass judgment on truths of faith and morals, but determines whether an act at the act at hand, the present act, is in conformity with moral goodness. All right. What should I do in this particular situation? All right. All right. So content of morality. So instructions for living an excellent human life. You've got the virtues, Ten Commandments. Hey, wait, what happened here? Okay, moral truth, Ten Commandments, virtues. There's uh, Moses. What am I to do in this situation? So there, you see the arrow down? So it's you know, all the moral truths we know is right, and then apply it to a particular situation. 
like you're in church, all right? It's during church, and you're tempted internally. You thought, maybe I should talk to my neighbor next to me. No, no, no. And you're like, no, I know I'm not, not to. So my conscience is telling me, be quiet, pay attention, be focused on, on, on the Mass. All right? That's when you follow. So it helps me. Conscience helps you apply moral truth uh, properly to your life. Now I got a little funny thing of, uh, okay, so this is uh, maybe learning math, whatever level of math, you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, fractions, order operations. I don't know if you've got more on that, you know, how you do addition. I mean, you do multiplication, division before you do addition in a, in a big problem. Uh, but anyways, so how you do a math problem. And then oh, Mr. Barry's math problem. Here's Mr. Barry's math problem. He was a teacher at one of the schools I was that was that where I taught. Um, uh, here's his math problem. Okay, so you got to lose all your math, all your math knowledge. You got to solve this problem. Okay, so we would call that math conscience. All right, you could call it conscience math. We don't we don't really speak of it that way, but if you get the sense, like conscience is applying, we call it moral conscience, applying moral truth to a particular situation. That's it. There's another example here. All right. We got here writing composition, so format, style, vocab, spelling, grammar. All right, and then Mrs. Kaufman's uh, five paragraph essay assignments. All right, there it is. Uh, here's your bell work. She always gave work right away, and when, they, when the bell rang right away to get the kids working. So, applying to write a paper, you have to know all, all these different things about language and you know, words, vocab, and such. So, this would be you could pay uh, language or uh, English conscience, if you will. <laughs> How to use the English conscience, English language in a particular situation to write a, write a paper or a type of paper. All right, our next one. Geology, very important. Tectonic plates, rocks, lava. All right, so applying it for uh, avoiding lava. See the application of Mario? You know, ge geology true. Lava is bad, so you want to avoid uh, the lava. And so... Mario avoids the law. Okay, that's more of a joke one. Uh, and then U.S. history, events, debates, uh, I mean, battle, dates, battles. All right. A question like, what would be different if the South, North and South never reunited? All right. So you could, like, a, a what ifs questions and stuff in history. Uh, and uh, this teacher here, uh, if the North and South did not re reunite, uh, the WWF would never have formed. Huh, okay, well, we wouldn't have wrestling then. Huh, probably wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, and so, moral truth, conscience, is really applying to the line. It's the line here. Your moral truth, your act of conscience is applying it to a particular... So you're doing it, you're using your conscience all the time. Whether you're going to listen to your parents or not, whether you're going to do your work or not. Um, so you're, Internally, we're making judgments. We're, we're deciding, okay, what am I going to do now? Uh, and what, what, what are my duties? Uh, and what are the things I ought to do? What, what ought I not to do? All right, so um, that's, uh, there's conscience. I don't know what all this is. Okay. Oh, and then we got determined. We will, we'll go into these things later, maybe, you know. Of, don't worry about these other things. I forgot about all this. Oh, yeah, here's some, here's some examples. So during passing period, Michael pushes Jack in the hallway to get back at him. Is that a good action or not? All right. What, what did, did, uh, what was Michael, if Michael's conscience probably was telling him, don't, don't push Jack. All right. And he did it anyway. So he just dis disobeyed his conscience. All right. So Rob helps Jim pick up books, the book he dropped. So when he saw someone who needed help, so his conscience, his, his mind was like, that person needs help. I can help them. All right. So. Um, and other ones on here. Oops, uh, there we are. Excellent. So that's uh, that's our chapter, first chapter. Um, it normally, won't be all this long, but I say I wanted to get that video in. All right, so you get a little taste of. Uh, so I have a couple other ones later in this year for the mass, um, but help to better explain conscience. It's not, a, it's not this little, merely inner voice, external voice or internal voice of someone else. No, it's our mind decide, I know what is right to do in this situation. Am I going to do what I know is right or am I not going to do what I know is right? And that's when we follow our conscience or not. So let's just end with a prayer here, asking the Lord to help us form our, have our conscience formed well and to always do what we know is right. 
in the Father, and in the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, you created us wondrously with the mind uh, and the ability to choose freely. We ask that you help us know what is true, what is good, Form our minds so that we always make good choice. We know it is true, and then give us the strength, our will strength, so that we then choose what we know is right. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, and the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.